it's Jan from Jan Does Reviews and today I'm going to review the book Spellbreaker by Charlie Holmberg. Um, she also wrote the Paper Magician series. I read the first book but nothing else in the series and honestly I couldn't tell you what the book was about. It just wasn't very memorable. Um, but this was my Kindle first selection for October. Uh, I actually could have chosen two but this was the only one that looked kind of interesting and it did it it definitely hooked me so I'm um, can't wait for the next book in the series to, to come out um, which is supposed to be I think spring of next year but um, it is hang on let me check my notes here 290 pages long on the Kindle version that I had and it is set in London England um, in 1895 and this is a fantasy book um, it's all about magic and magic users um, just like you know it was an everyday occurrence so not too terribly different from Victorian England that we're familiar with you know Charles Dickens kind of stuff and um, I forgot her name now Jane Austen took me a second um, but I'm also going to put on my Halloween makeup not like super ghoulish or anything um but you know to do my halloween house tour which i'm going to do when it starts to get a little darker um so twofold purpose of this video um first off there are four kinds of magic that is studied and you aren't born with magic but you can have a um, natural aptitude for it and you learn it and um, drops are extracted from your essence and they glow if you have magical ability and um, drops are used as payment for these um, spells the more complex the spell the more drops you have to pay so it's it's the magical currency um, the four schools of magic are spiritual magic, which um, is basically blessings and curses, uh, temporal magic, which affects times, effects on things. Like you can't make um, a person time travel, but you can like uh, remove wrinkles from a person's face because age has cause that. You can um, erase vertebrae off of copper, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, you can also add it to age something, which I imagine would be really good for a black marketer, but it never actually says that in the book, but yeah. Okay. Um, next school of magic is rational magic, and that is someone who can affect your thoughts and feelings. And then the last one is physical magic. And that is magic that affects physical things. Um, there is a uh, low level, he's a novice um, physical aspector is what they call it. Yeah, all the magicians, they're aspectors. And um, Ogden, Cuthbert Ogden is um, a low level physical aspector. And he is a stonemason and um, also a painter. So he buys white paint because it's basically very cheap and then he uses a spell which you pay for with drops and then once you have the spell it's yours and um, you can, he changes colors of the paint to whatever he needs. So you see what I'm saying with that. Okay, so um, the main character is Elsie Camden, little backstory here leading up to it. Um, she is an orphan, and she is of the fifth type of magic, which is highly regulated because these magicians are born. They're not made. Um, and she is a spell breaker, which is hence the name of the book. Um, she can dissolve any form of magic. And she basically, um, the way she sees them are knots. So she just has to unravel the knots, and the spell just disappears. So, um, she's the main character. The also, um, Bac Bacchus, 
what was his last name? I forget. He's not a lord, but he is a sugarcane plantation owner in Barbados. Bacchus Kelsey. And he is um, an apprentice physical aspector, and he has come to London to take his test to become a master. So he can handle the most complex of spells. Um, he's very wealthy. He has a family friend, the Lord of Kent, who is also, you know, in the story quite a bit. And um, the Lord of Kent has no magical abilities whatsoever, nor does his wife, but one of their daughters um, is showing um, an inclination towards spiritual magic. So, and the villain is a big mystery. All right, so let's start with the story. So our story opens with a prologue and it is Elsie when she is 11, I believe. Hang on, I wrote all this stuff. Um, let's see. Yeah, she's 11, okay. She's in a London workhouse and she is with a group huddled around um, huddled around a burning building and it is the workhouse and Elsie is basically kind of hiding. Um, she knows she's a spell breaker, but she didn't know what an actual spell was. She knows that she is unregistered and unlicensed, so um, she, she knows she'll get in trouble for removing the fire protection spell from the workhouse, but she didn't know what it was at the time. She just thought she saw it was gold, it was pretty, nobody else seemed to see it, so she was fascinated with it and traced along its edges and it unraveled. And then um, the workhouse um, supervisor, I guess is what you would call him, um, he got drunk, fell asleep, and knocked his lantern over and it caught fire. So the group of kids are all huddled outside watching the building burn and she is trying her best to avoid the law because she's convinced she'll, she'll hang for it. Because, you know, she's 11. What does she know? She doesn't tell anybody she's a spell breaker. And as she is um, moving away from the crowd, a lady in a dark cloak with a cowled, you know, hood over her face approaches her and asks her her name. And somehow she detects that Elsie is a spellbreaker. And um, she convinces Elsie to come away with her, that she won't have to go back to a workhouse, that she'll be provided for and cared for. And, you know, for an orphan, that's, that's all she wants. And then um, it opens up to the actual story. And Elsie is in, um, I guess you would call it a suburb, but it's the countryside surrounding London. And it's a um, small village called Brookley. And it's described as being large enough that it wants for all the basic needs. But if you wanted a milliner, you'd have to go to a larger town like Kent or I can't remember the other one. But um, mainly because it doesn't play into the story. So, um, yeah. So they're in Brooklyn. She is working for, she calls him Master Ogden. He is not a master aspector. He is a master stonemason. So Cuthbert Ogden is her employer. Um, and she has left Brooklyn and gone to London on an errand. And 
she calls them the cowls and this is the lady who rescued her from the um the workhouse so she's on a mission and the mission is to remove a spell on a mr turner's i think he i don't know if he's a lord turner or just um a squire but he is a landowner and she's been told that um, he has purposely lost tenants rents where they have to pay double and has um, records that are being hidden away and she has to undo a, um, a spell that hides a back doorway that will lead to the, the room with all these ledgers that will prove that these tenants have been um, basically overcharged. And so she removes the spell and as, right as she finishes, she runs into the squire who is over her little village and he's a real asshole too. Um, but he doesn't even recognize her and ask what she's doing. And so she tells a half truth. And she says that she was admiring the brickwork because she works for a stonemason, which she thinks is bizarre, but tells her she needs to hurry on and be about her way, that she shouldn't be in that neighborhood to begin with, you know. But she is dressed not... Um, not like a peasant, but not like she's a, a wealthy landowner or part of um, the nobility. She's just, you know, middle class, just trying not to draw attention to herself. And this is not her first mission for the cowls, as she calls them. Um, she has done several over the years. They've gotten, as her skills have progressed, um, her missions have gotten more complex. This one's not terribly hard. And it thrills her to know that she is righting wrongs and that she is useful. Um, and they, they play upon that a lot in this book. That her need for, to be useful and not cast aside like her family did to her. Or at least we're led to believe that. Um, so she... She hurries back to Brooklyn. She gets back in time. Nothing's amiss. It's all well and good. And um, Emmeline is the other. They're not really. They're, they're servants, but they're not like slaves. Um, they're both employed by uh, Master Ogden. And Emmeline is the cook and housekeeper. And she replaced... Elsie, who started out as his cook and housekeeper when she was 12. <clears throat> that missing year, she actually worked for the squire as a scullery maid and hated every second of it. So when she saw an ad in the newspaper, don't ask me how a Victorian child reads, raised in a workhouse, doesn't go into that. But <clears throat> she reads an advertisement where um, Mr. Ogden was looking for help, so she, she applies and is hired. And then um, he hires Emmeline, and she becomes his assistant. And she helps um, with anything that's needed around the house. She uh, does the shopping in the market. She um, takes his orders, records his payments. You know, she keeps the ledgers for him. And um, she also has, you know, she has a chatelaine. So she's got all the keys to the house, including where his drops are hidden. Because he does have magical ability. She keeps it secret from everyone that she is a spellbreaker because she's convinced at her age that um, no good can come of anyone finding out that she is an unlicensed and unregistered spellbreaker. So, that leads you up to her coming back home. Um, Emmeline is cooking. Um, I think she says she smells mutton. 
Um, she rips up her note that had the instructions, but she, it says that she normally does that before she ever goes, but because she was going to London and she wasn't familiar with where she was going and didn't want to stand out, she kept the directions this time. So she gets home, she rips them up, throws them into the, the kitchen fire, you know, because Emmeline's cooking. Um, and can't decide what kind of brush I'm going to use here. Um, actually, no, don't, I think I'll go with that one. Oh, um, sorry. Trying a new ColourPop Cream Eyeshadow in the shade Laurel to, um, basically as a primer to make my eyeshadows really pop because we're going to be doing purple and orange. Um, okay, back to the story. So she gets home, all is well, nothing suspected. She does not a lot of traveling in her work for Ogden, but a fair amount. You know, she has to go to other villages that are fairly close by to get different supplies that he might need um, for his painting and um, stonemason work. So, I'm not sure what the excuse was for today, but she um, has to go to the post office and the thing that I think is really cool is um, the, it's not the spiritual, the uh, rational aspectors can affect the feelings and behavior of animals as well. So they keep dogs that deliver the post. That's just, I think that's cool. I would really like that, I think. So um, anyway, she has to go to the post office and mail something for Ogden and also um, a letter for herself. And she does this every few months. Um, she was abandoned in Juniper Down by her family at age six. And um, they were traveling. She doesn't remember why, because, you know, she's six. She remembers what her mother and father look like. They've gotten blurrier, you know, over the course of the years. Um, and she is 21 at the time of this story. Um, so she mails a letter to the lady that they had stayed the night with because the weather was quite bad. And um, when she woke up the next morning at Agatha Hall's house um, where they had stayed the night, her family is completely gone. She's just, she's the only one. Nobody knows anything. Agatha doesn't know anything. She doesn't know what happened in the middle of the night. She just knows they disappeared. So <clears throat> she sent, um, the Halls weren't wealthy either. They were just, you know, offering hospitality from the bad weather to travelers. And um, they couldn't afford to keep her, so that's how she ended up in the workhouse in London. So she sends a letter, you know, every few months asking if anyone has come looking for her, you know, hoping that her family has come back trying to find her, you know, something. And so she posts that, and as she goes home, um, there's, I don't know whether to mention all the little side stories or not, but she stopped by one of the villagers for a small um, order that is needed. Um, Master Ogden needs to do. So, you know, she, she takes it, listens, gives an estimated price and about how long it'll take Master Ogden to, to um, repair the piece. And goes on her merry way. She gets home and um, there's not a lot going on so she decides she loves to read. Again, really. But we're going to suspend our disbeliefs for the moment. She um, she goes upstairs to get her novel reader and um, if any of you all are familiar with Charles Dickens, he wrote in this style. Um, 
where they would be um, the works a novel wouldn't be released in one big edition it would be released in chapters and these chapters would be published and sold you know a week or a couple of weeks or a month or however long it takes um, but piecemeal basically so she's got her novel reader and it's an exciting damsel in distress pirate kind of you know victorian novel gothic um and she goes upstairs to get it and a note from the cowls comes falling out with a new mission and um some money and it tells her that she has to go to kent because the earl of kent is keeping his servants um basically stuck in the house they cannot leave it and uh, has a spell where it burns them if they try to leave so she has to remove the spell from um, the servant's entrance at the back of the house so they can leave if they want to which you know she is under the impression that they want to else he wouldn't have it on there and that, you know he's just a real cruel bastard so she goes she decides um, she has to run an errand for Cuthbert to pick up some um, specialty paint, um, a metallic, because he he can change the color, but he can't make it into a metallic finish. So she has to go for some gold paint. So she um, kind of, you know, another half truth. She um, says that she has a friend that she would like to visit if that was all right and that she would be back in the morning and he tells her that would be fine to go ahead and hire a cab because he didn't want her traveling in the dark at night so she hires the cab to go there and um she gets the paint she hides it and then she goes in under the cover of darkness she goes to the um earl of kent's i guess it would be a castle but his estate and there's a, a few little magical traps here and there for like burglars or poachers or such. And she laments the need for such practices and, you know, poor downtrodden servants and, you know, the whole, the whole thing. And um, I'm just getting all my eyeshadows out here so I can look. I'm not exactly sure what kind of look I'm going to do. I just know it's going to be orange and purple. That's about as far as I got. So, yeah. Alrighty. Let's get some craziness going. What do you say? Um, so, she finds the spell on, um, and she tell, she can tell it's a, it's a fire spell that it will cause a fire. So she, um, you know, she has to go to the village that's attached to Kent. Remember the milliner? Yeah. Um, and pick up a basket. I forget. I think it, I forget the name she had to go. I think it was Shaw. Anyway, in the basket is a selection of cheeses, grapes, and uh, two bottles of wine. And she knocks on the door for the servants, posing as um, like she's selling this stuff door to door. And she offers the wine at a ridiculously low price. And apparently, the Earl of Kent loves Madeira. And so that is promptly bought, I guess. And while the housekeeper goes for payment, she removes the spell from the doorknob. And she's rather pleased with herself, you know. And this isn't at night. I'm, I'm getting them mixed up. She has to go back to the house. But I'll get back to that. I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. I'm sorry. Um, she poses as um, a saleswoman, basically. And 
so she um, she sells her the wine. She removes the spell. Everything's great. And then she gets back to the house the next morning. Um, Emmeline greets her at the door. You know, they have some chit-chat, back and forth, blah, 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 blah. And... Um, Emmeline notices that Master Ogden has forgotten his trowels and he's working at the squire's house on a new commission. So, uh, Elsie says she'll take the trowels up to him because she's curious, you know, what the squire's doing to his estate and she, you know, she's just being nosy. And then the two town gossips, which are the ba bank's daughters, um, bank owner, his daughters, um, they're horrible gossips, and she listens to the latest gossip heading to the squire's house and listening to them about a murder where um, there was an aspector, <clears throat> he was murdered and his opus was not found, and what a scandal it is. And anytime an aspector dies, all the spells that they have attained and learned um, instead of like, you know, a soul going up to heaven or anything, a little leather bound book, their body disappears and a book is left and that's it. So it's basically their soul and <clears throat> it contains all their spells that they have learned. And, um, yeah, I know I'm going very dark here. No opus was found. And, you know, the more spells you know, the bigger the opus will be. And apparently this one should have been of some size. So, you know, that's kind of a scandal. And, um, so she's listening to this. She makes it to the squire's house. She knocks on the, um, the front door instead of the servant's entrance because there's a line to the servant's entrance. Heaven forbid. Can't be in a line. That's that's just insanity. But, um, and she, yeah, I'm having a hard time keeping my words together and, and doing this eye look. I'm starting to think that doing my makeup while I do these is not a good idea. Just saying. Um, she definitely has a bit of an attitude about being the working class and um, the nobility and gentry, which is what the squire is. He's gentry, since he's not nobly born. Never be king. Um, but anyway, so she goes, um, the master of the household, the butler, you know, he, um, Answers the door, takes her to Master Ogden. She gives him his trowels, and then she heads back. And um, when she gets back to the house, a note falls out of her bag, her little chatelaine bag that she keeps all the house keys in. And, you know, the household money for, she makes, you know, when she goes to market and buys the meats and vegetables and stuff that they don't grow. So, or keep. Um, yeah, I think I'm done with this palette. Okay. Still having a hard time focusing. Just bear with me, okay? So, <clears throat> she goes back to the house. Um, a note slips out of her purse, basically. And she is absolutely mystified as to how the cowls got it into her purse. And it is directing her to go back to Kent. That it is imperative that she removes that spell from the door. Well, she's removed the spell. What you don't know is that in the meantime, Bacchus Kelly has arrived and is staying with the Duke of Kent. And he is a physical aspect door. And, um... He has put the spell back on the door after she had removed it. 
So she has no clue that this dude is there. And she, um, she goes back under the cover of darkness this time, going through the woods, bemoaning, you know, the, the poachers are only poaching because, you know, they're starving. Obviously. Poor downtrodden man. And she um, runs into a few traps that Bacchus has laid on the estate. She disables all of them, no problem. Um, she is a master spellbreaker without having ever been taught. She just, you know, natural affinity. And so she gets to the door and she can sense the fire spell there. Um, different spells show up differently. Um, the physical spells, she said, are very showy. They want to be seen. So um, she sees them as, you know, glitter and color. And um, she hears the spiritual ones. She can smell the rational ones and she sees the physical smells hears and let's see I know I'm forgetting oh temporal I can't remember there's not a whole lot of temporal spells they do show up but not not many um, in the book and I don't remember how she senses those but yeah um She, um, she sees the fire spell is back and is totally confused because she has failed in her, her job for the cowls. And she is um, very aggravated, confused, and um, I guess that's what trips her up. And back is Kelly, who is half black, by the way. And his, his mother was a Moor from Spain, and his father was a white Englishman. And he inherited the plantation on his father's death in Barbados, which I did not know this. If you are from Barbados, you are a Bahan. But anyway, yeah, it's interesting sh stuff you, you, you learn from books. Um, how accurate that is? Beats the hell out of me. But that's how it goes in the book. All right, I think I'm going to get a pencil liner. Uh, maybe I'll just go with the smudger. Um, before I do underneath my eyes, I'm going to put a little concealer on first, though. There it is. Okay. And I'm not going to color correct because I want to emphasize the, uh, the grayness of my under eye circles. So, we are, uh, where are we? Okay. Bacchus Kelsey catches her, grabs her by the hand, catches her. She's freaking out. You know, she can't be caught because then she'll be useless and she'll be abandoned yet again, which is a constant issue through the whole book for her. You know, she's got to have some kind of hang up. And she can't just be, you know, attractive and successful and everything, right? Um, so, she tries to pull away. He's really strong. You know, he's handsome, dark skinned, hidden in the shadows. He grabs her. He's quite angry that she has undone the spell. He keeps insisting that it was put there um, to keep burglars out. And she is convinced that she has made some kind of mistake that the cows wouldn't have sent her on a mission that wasn't just. And so, she, you know, she keeps, she says that she was hired. She's a spell breaker. You know, basically, she tells him everything except where she's from, but he figures that out because, you know, she keeps slipping up because she's not perfect. 
And um, so they work out a deal since she was hired under false pretenses that she will work off her debt to him. And she tells him, you know, that she's got a regular job, that this was just something that she had done trying to right a social wrong. And um, he agrees to, to work with her, um, but doesn't tell her what she'll be doing. So basically they're upgrading the Earl's security. So over the course of, uh, I'd say a week, um, she's back and forth when she's able to from her regular gig with Ogden. She's back and forth to um, the estate in Kent working with Bacchus. And what he is doing is um, he can strengthen the spells, but it's a lot more complicated than just putting a fresh new one on. So she undoes all the old ones that are fading. Um, they, they, all the spells apparently, you know, they have time limits the better ones last longer. Um, so, you know, you have a novice, an apprentice, and a master. So, a novice spell isn't going to last as long. Um, which I, I find kind of funny because if you think about it, all these paintings that Ogden does and sells, he's a novice. It's not a complicated spell. But he's changing white paint into all these different colors, so they're going to be left with a white canvas eventually. Just saying. Um, now, where was I in the story? Okay, so they're going around, and they're going around the perimeter of the estate, and she's undoing all the, the older spells that are um, breaking down, degrading, you know, falling apart. And then he puts fresh new ones on. And um, then they get the estate completely done. She runs into the Earl by accident. Um, and the Earl misunderstands what she's doing there and thinks that she is um, a lady friend of Bacchus's. And so she ends up with a dinner invitation to the Earl of Kent's with his family, uh, which is way, way above her social caste. So, um, she ends up going, of course, and she meets, um, a spiritual master, um, Lily Merton. And she is there, um, trying to convince the Earl to allow his daughter, who is, um, sensitive to magic, especially the spiritual, and to um, letting her attend school and learning more to become a master of spiritual like Ms. Merton herself. And uh, anyway, everything goes fine. Not a big deal. She has a good time. Um, they all think that she is uh, a love interest of Bacchus's. Meanwhile, Bacchus's story, um, he goes to each of the four magics have um, a governing board. The Athenium is what they're called, and that's where you go to study. Um, there's a library with all of the most um, complex and super secret spells. And they're governed by a council. Um, this is a physical Athenium is uh, got a council of 11. I don't know if all the councils have 11. It doesn't go into any other Athenium other than the physical one. Um, he goes and there is a certain spell that he wants to attain with his um, master license, I guess is how you would call it. Um, they agree that he can test to be a master, but he cannot have that, that spell. It is, um, too closely guarded, and for him to be living on Barbados, they just, they don't trust that he'll be up to no good. And it's basically like a teleportation spell. Uh, spell. He can make himself 
disappear and reappear somewhere else or things. And he says, you know, that this will be a huge help because he is in Barbados. But they don't, they don't see it that way. So they deny him halfway. And um, so he's aggravated, you know, that he doesn't get the spell that he wants. And um, he's decided that he uh, there's an auction coming up with a uh, a very large master opus that's going to be at this auction, and so he goes to the auction and tries to bid on it because it's supposed to contain the spell that he's wanting that he's he's been denied, and anyone can activate a spell from an opus. You just take the sheet out, you say the Latin word, which I don't remember what it is right now, sorry. I think it's like extante or extant, I don't know, it was something with the EX. Um, anyway, you just say the words and the spell ignites and the, you know, the paper just disappears and the spell's gone. So, you know, one time use kind of thing. Whereas um, the actual spell makers, by the way, that's the name of the next book, um, they have these spells, once they exchange the drops, which just disappear into the, the other, um, the spell is ingrained upon their souls, I guess, and they can use it as many times as they want without having to worry about drops. So, that's how that works. And, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I think I'm not going to do makeup anymore whenever I do these book reviews because it, it is really, really hard to stay focused on two different things at the same time, even though that would be my specialty. But, yeah. Um, okay. So. Where am I going with this? Um, he goes, he's outbid. He gets into an argument um, with the man who outbid him on this opus that he really wants because he is desperate to have this spell. And um, it's a quite public argument since they, it's the close of the auction. And he is trying, he's like, he's like, I'll give you any price that you name just for the one page. And that interests the guy. And then he's like, no, not when he finds out what spell it is that he actually wants. He's like, no, 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 I'm, I'm, no, that's too valuable. So Bacchus is noted to be very upset by this. And um, leaves the auction. Well, in a couple of days, the dude that bought it has a break-in. And the opus is stolen. He barely survives with his life. He is in a, a hospital of some sort. But the opus is gone. Um, oof, that was not good. That's some major fallout there. Wow. Okay. How do we fix this? That's kind of working. Try and touch it up here. There we go. Okay. Not quite the emergency I was envisioning. That's good. Um, so... This, this really got dark in a hurry. Um, hmm. Just, yeah, I'm salvaging my makeup. Sorry. Um...
that leads us back to um, Bacchus and Elsie. And they've noted, or he's been requested if um, he could take a look because the crops are failing, but only in certain areas. So the Earl doesn't want to say that somebody has cursed his crops, but he suspects something like that has happened. So Bacchus and Elsie are searching for it, um, a curse on the, the crops because they're in very odd places. Not, you know, where the crops are, um, could be evident that it's, you know, um, a logical failing, you know, like, um, the seeds rotting from trenches of water, you know, is nothing evident. So, um... Yeah, I'm not happy with this. It's not quite going the direction I was thinking. Um, anyway. I'm going to hop off of here and finish up my makeup real fast. And then I will hop back on and I will um, finish up the book. I think that will be the most sensible at this point because I'm not exactly happy with how my makeup is turning out and it's I need to focus on that and uh, it's very distracting to keep seeing myself and not being happy with the eye look so yeah be right back okay so I'm back still not super happy with the eye look that I've created, but it's better than what it was, and this will do. I'm tired of messing with it. So, this is what I have created. I think it's bordering on vampy. Okay. Where was I with the story? Um, Bacchus and Elsie are touring the um, estate of Kent and looking at the different um, crops that have failed for no apparent reason that anyone can figure out. And um, Elsie does discover a couple of curses placed on these crops. And uh, Bacchus suspects um, a lady. Um, she is the wife of a I guess competing earls, what you would call it. She is um, has some minor spiritual um, aspecting. I don't know. I don't know if it says that she's a master or an apprentice. Um, she's not a novice. I know that much. But at any rate, um, he suspects that she is the one who has um, placed these curses on the crops for failing. And um, of course, Elsie dismantles them. And they, um, on their way back, they go through the village and he points out this, um, lady. And I mean that as in, you know, the wife of some nobility. She is a lady something, you know. Um, I just don't remember her specific name because she's not an important character. Um, he points her out and she's like, well, would you like me to, she notices she has a couple of spells upon her person um, that affect her um, appearance. So she's like, you want me to do something about that? And he's like, can you? And so she follows her into a dress shop where she is um, talking with a friend and she uh creates a bit of a scene by accident by bumping into her and when she bumps into her they knock a table of um different accessories for dresses off into the floor and of course you know the shopkeeper's all upset and the lady is is telling elsie she's you know a, a clumsy oaf and good for nothing trash and you know just basically giving her what for 
And so while she's doing that, Elsie very subtly undoes a couple of spells. So the lady's one side of her face is really wrinkled. The other side is really smooth. Um, one side of her hair, I think, turns incredibly gray all of a sudden instead of being um, the vibrant color that it is. It's just, you know, petty but amusing. Anyway, so this happens. She escapes. Um, then I think it's a Sunday. Oh, well, I take it back. We need to backtrack just, just a little. Um, her and uh, Bacchus are walking back to the estate at Kent and um, at the dinner party that she went to as Bacchus's love interest, supposedly. And they are starting to develop feelings for one another, of course. Um, she notices that Bacchus has two spells on him. And after she has done this kindness for uh, petty revenge for uh, the Kent estate, he tells her that she is she's done you know there's no reason and she's like well there's something that puzzles me what are the two spells that you wear and he's like what do you mean two i only know of one and uh when he was a teenager he was afflicted with polio and so he um had his father had a spell placed on him to slow a temporal spell to slow its um progression so he gets tired very easily. Um, his magical powers aren't quite what they should be, you know, if he was healthy. Um, so that is the one spell that Bacchus is aware of. He doesn't, he's like totally perplexed. He's, he's like, there's not a second spell that I know of, you know. And so they go their separate ways. He goes back to the estate. She goes back to Brooklyn, um, to Ogden's house where she lives. And, um, Sunday comes, and Ogden, Emmeline, and Elsie all go to church, and they don't ever go to the church in Brooklyn. Um, Ogden goes around to different churches all through the countryside. Um, it's just one of his little peculiarities, and um, they're at church, and um, she wanders away after the service dismisses and bumps into um, Master Lily Merton, literally, and um, knocks up books and papers and stuff. And um, Master Merton is um, upset because the spiritual Athenaeum has been uh, broken into and... Um, she blames it on some novice students and says that um, several spell books have gone missing, opuses, and um, says that she's sure that they will, will turn up, And but it's just, you know, it's very upsetting to lose these opuses when all these murders and break-ins are happening and privately owned opuses are also disappearing and what a strange thing it is. And, um, she, you know, they pick up the papers and books and stuff and they go their ways and, you know, um, they come back to the house and, uh, afternoon tea comes and I don't know if this is the same day or a later day. Just, just go with me. I'm just giving you the overview of the book, right? My impressions. Kelsey has figured out. Bacchus, Bacchus Kelsey, uh, has figured out where Elsie Camden lives in Brooklyn. And he shows up and um, introduces himself as a friend, says that they met at the market. Um, Ogden's not suspicious. He also assumes it's a love interest of Elsie's. And uh, privately, Kels or Bacchus says to Elsie, that he wants her to remove the spells and that he has contacted the temporal um, aspect or to remove it so she can see what the spell underneath is and remove it as well because it really bothers him that he never knew he had a second spell on him. And, um, and they'll be there at the temporal aspect or who put the 
slowing spell on him for the polio to begin with so he can put it right back on after the second spell that's underneath is removed. And um, she's like, well, that's fine and great. I'd be happy to do it, but how am I going to get away? You come up with a good excuse for me that is acceptable, you know, and I'll go with you because it's going to be like um, a couple of days journey there and a couple of days back. Well, the next day, um, Ogden receives a letter from a school that is opening where this temporal aspect or is um, that uh, is accepting women now and is teaching advanced accounting spell or um, not spells advanced accounting classes for women and he thinks that's a great idea and is going to send Elsie there and um, agrees that he will pay for her lodging, transportation, and half the cost of the class. And Elsie, since it'll be a skill she can keep and take to another employer should she leave, is paying for the other half, which I think sounds extremely generous for the times. Um, needless to say, <clears throat> Bacchus has arranged all this and forged the letter for the school asking if, you know, Elsie would like to attend. He picks her up um, with the Duke of Kent's carriage. They travel, like, you know, exchange details about each other's lives and what it was like growing up in Barbados and, you know, that kind of stuff. Anyway, they get there. The temporal aspect or removes the spell, and Elsie discovers the spell underneath is. Um, a rational spell, but it's draining Bacchus of all, his, not all his power, but a, a significant portion, and it is sending it to somewhere that she can't detect, but she knows that there is a line from the, the knot work that sends it to someone, so someone is benefiting from the energy drain Bacchus is experiencing, so she removes it. And all of a sudden, he's completely whole and healthy. They had misdiagnosed it. It was not polio. It was this spell that was placed upon him, draining his energy. And he can't figure out who or why they would do it because, um, you know, he's lived most of his life in Barbados where there are not many aspectors to begin with. And um, the few times he's been in England, he hasn't been where anyone could actually place a rational spell on him without him knowing. Um, neither one of his parents were magically gifted. So he's just totally perplexed. So he's extremely grateful that Elsie has um, basically saved him from this horrible thing. Well, um, as their uh, they're getting ready to go to a, a lodging house, which I guess is basically like their version of a hotel for the times. Um, Elsie finds another note from the Cowles and cannot figure out <clears throat> how these things keep getting delivered to her. She's, you know, she's very, very curious, wondering, you know, who is part of it. She really would like to know, but then again, she also doesn't want to know because if she doesn't, and that's contingent upon them needing her, you know, that kind of thing, back and forth, back and forth. I want to know, but should I know that whole kind of situation? Um, but anyway, she discovers it and it sends her on another mission. So she leaves and Bacchus is totally confused and she begs him, you know, not to ask questions um, that this is, you know, part of her other job and uh, that she's been hired to do. And it's sending her to a place that has magical implements. So they've had um, spells placed on them um, that are... I can't remember exactly how they worded it. 
but basically that they were um, catching poachers easily because of it and these poachers were only poaching because they were starving remember that whole argument a while back yeah um, and that there was also a carriage that had been magically reinforced that needed to be dispelled um, that was going to be transferring these caught poachers uh, to a court and that it was all just a huge injustice so she goes to this other town completely out of the way. She says she'll send word to Bacchus letting him know, you know, that she arrived home safely. Um, so he agrees. They go their separate ways. She finds the magical implements, uh, undoes all the spells on them. She finds the carriage in the carriage house. Um, and while the, um, shopkeeper is distracted, she slips in and, um, and does all the spells on it and um, goes home, sends a telegram to Bacchus letting her, him know that, that she arrived home safely. Well, she gets a message and I may be getting the timeline a little screwed up. Sorry about that. Um, it has been a week since I've read this book. I have started reading another one. So sorry about any indiscrepancies should y'all read this. Um, but she gets a telegram from Agatha Hall in um, Juniper Down, where she was abandoned by her family, saying someone has come looking to come immediately. So she lets Ogden know he's all excited for her, you know, that she's her questions are finally going to be answered about her family and why she was left behind. And um, so she travels to Juniper Down. She notices, you know, it's a very small community. It's smaller than Brooklyn. Um, but she notices that a lot of them are wearing black. And it's because um, a couple of students had um, died. And that, you know, bothers her. But she meets up with Agatha, and Agatha says, yes, um, your father was here. I remember him clear as the day um, from the day that, you know, you were uh, left behind. And he left this um, message for you and hands her an envelope. And it says for her to meet him at, um, at a tree, at a fork in a road. You know, she asks Agatha about it, and she's like, oh, yes, yes, that's, you know, you go on the road towards this, and it's just a little ways down, and doesn't seem to think anything odd about it. So, Elsie goes, she waits, and is attacked by an American man, and she's very puzzled, and he, um, he thinks she's behind some nasty, um, threatening messages that he's been getting from Elsie Camden. And then he's puzzled because she's not who he thinks she is. And he, he tells her she's just a, a pawn in all of this. And she can't figure out why an American and that Agatha claims that he is the same man that abandoned her. She's not American. She's English. What the hell, right? So, um, the guy realizes that... Elsie's been duped in a lot of things, and she's just left confused, and he leaves her. Um, he has a gun, by the way, because, you know, we're American, um, and that's what we do. But he doesn't shoot her. Everything's okay, um, other than Elsie just has a lot more unanswered questions about her past and what the hell's going on. So she goes back to Agatha and pieces start to fall into place when she gets more bits of stories about what happened with the um, student who died and that's why everybody in the community is wearing black because they're mourning him and it's leading back to um, a fire that happened and it was because the magical instruments that would put out a fire had been dispelled and a, um, an important opus from this guy's instructor um, 
was being transported and he was away at the time and he was being transported in a magically guarded carriage which had also been dispelled. So this important opus disappears. Um, the master instructor is murdered. His opus is also gone. Uh, the student has died because the uh, school he was at burned and Elsie is putting all this together because she dispelled the carriage. She dispelled um, the special tools that, you know, were, would help with putting out the fire. Um, and then she starts thinking back on all these other murders and thefts and realizes that she has been totally played and um, starts linking all the pieces into what's going on and then she uh, realizes that Ogden her master is behind it all and um, she gets <clears throat> I've left something out but I'm not sure where um, she's going through storeroom putting things in order for Ogden by the way and discovers the seal <clears throat> that the cows, <coughs> excuse me, the cows always mark their messages with. And it's an owl's foot, claw, and something else. I can't remember what the cross is. It. Anyway, it's a unique seal. And she discovers it in a jar in the back of the drawer of Ogden's supplies. So Ogden is the one who's been putting all these messages and uh, from the cowls to her. So he's one of them. And she, you know, that was on her mind with the whole back and forth, do I say something, do I not? Sorry. And <clears throat> he has a um, another assistant um, who is in business with him who does a lot of his deliveries, Nash. And um, Emmeline is terrified of Nash. And Elsie is not. She doesn't know what the heck is wrong with Emmeline. <clears throat> that she is so repulsed by him. But she starts to put things together. And she's like, Nash must be doing the dirty work. And is the one who is getting all these opuses for Ogden. Who is a novice aspector. And needs the magic for whatever. Um, anyway... She doesn't know the why. She just knows that she has been totally used and all these social injustices that she thought she was fixing, she is not. She's just been creating complete chaos and has ruined society. Put people in fear for their lives, um, for the spells that, that they contain on their souls. So she rushes back um, to get to Bacchus and get his help. And Nash has, he has, um, gone, he is going after, she's figured it out that they are going after Bacchus next. And, um, she stops Nash in time and in the process of discovering this, um, the attack on Bacchus, in the, the Earl of Kent's house, um, she discovers that she can undo a spell while it is being cast upon. You know, she can just do it in midair before it actually touches whatever it's directed at and can do it midair without even thinking. Um, she doesn't have to undo knots and stuff like previously she'd done. So this is a, a new discovered skill that she didn't even know she could do um, because, you know, she's unregistered, unlicensed, unschooled. And um, Nash is killed by her. Lily Merton is there also. Um, she takes the Duke and his family and, and um, they rush off while Bacchus and Elsie are um, in battle, magical battle with Nash and um, Nash dies they the servants call for the police um, the Duke of Kent apparently has a telegraph and um, it's been enchanted with 
um, a spell where, you know, they can send a message to the police and the police, you know, can get there even quicker. So it's basically like, you know, sending a text. Um, so the police arrive, they, they see what's going on. Elsie tells them, you know, that Ogden is behind it all. And um, they go immediately to Brooklyn to arrest Ogden, but Ogden has fled. And they have no idea how he knew to flee. And um, she's getting, you know, um, thinking back on past conversations and how he said one day Emmeline, Elsie, and him would um, go up to the docks in a certain part of London, up the River Thames, and um, leave and, you know, start a new life somewhere else. You know, one of those fantasy, you know, one day kind of situations. And so she gets to thinking on it and she's like, she knows that's where he's going to go. So her and Bacchus, um, ride horseback, scandalous, I know, right? Uh, all the way there. They finally, they do find him at the docks. Um, he starts throwing all these opus pages with these spells and, um, you know, basically booby trapping every inch of the way. Um, he completely engulfs Bacchus in a huge mound of rocks and dirt. He's like, you know, up to his shoulders and can't do any spells because he's bound and all this stuff. And Elsie can't get to the spell that's on him because it's underneath all the dirt and rocks to undo it. So um, he encourages her to stop Ogden before it's too late. So she, she leaves him and runs after Ogden and she finally catches him um, as he's trying to undo a small boat from the end of a dock and flee. And he's begging her to come with him and to go away at the same time and it's really confusing for her. And um, she starts undoing spells because she can, she realizes that he is a rational master. And that's why, um, I didn't tell you all that, sorry. You can only train in one of the four magics because um, if you train in any others, it diminishes your, um, your ability to become a master in another. So most are um, that are masters have never trained in any of the other magic disciplines. But that's the reason why, is because he's only a novice with physical aspecting because he is a master at rational. And he's an unregistered rational master, like Elsie. Um, and he is affecting her thoughts and feelings um, with, you know, he says, come with me, but he's pushing her and making her think, oh, I just need to go home and check on Emmeline and, you know, just oddball random thoughts. I really don't want to go with him, you know, this oddball things. She finally undoes the spell, gets free, stops Ogden and um, from fleeing. And he's like, it's a pattern. It's always been a pattern. And she notices that he has a spell on him also, like Bacchus did. And <clears throat> it's familiar. It feels the same. So um, she realizes that the pattern he has painted with all his little details in his paintings that he does that she has mentioned in passing it's a pattern. It's always the same. And that it has, it's a secret message to her on how to undo the spell. So, um, she undoes the spell and he is free. He has been under a compulsion to do these things for someone else. He's not actually a cowl. He's another pawn, just like Elsie. Um, he knew, of course, Elsie was a spell breaker because he was put under a spell and has been um, made to do these things by another rational master. Um, but he can't 
remember what they look like because of the spell. It's, it's like dimmed and fogged his memories. And um, so he can't, he knows in his head who it is, but he can't speak it, can't describe it in words. So Elsie gets, um, you know, because he's irrational and can make people think whatever he wants them to think, he gets the police to basically leave them alone and let them go. And um, Elsie gets him to draw who it is. And um, by the way, the, the police have freed Bacchus as well. Um, and she, he draws a picture of Master Lily Merton. So that's where the story ends. Um, Spell Maker is the next in the series, which I'm sure I will read when it comes out. Um, I really enjoyed it much more than I remember liking Paper Magician. Um, Charlie Holmberg is um, an American lady, by the way. Not British at all, but this felt very British. It felt, you know, Harry Potter kind of, but a little more grown up. Um, there, I really appreciated that there weren't a lot of unnecessary sex and cussing and you know just crap that doesn't add to a storyline at all usually um it was it took me maybe i really you know because i've got the secondary cataract which should be removed next week just so y'all know say a little prayer come tuesday 27th yeah that uh everything goes well um <clears throat> it's really been hard to read it it gives me headaches and um, i have to blink a whole lot to get my eyes to refocus where the words aren't as blurry or as dark so um and i love to read um so it's it took quite a bit longer than it normally would normally you know um 300 pages or less is a a day's read. It took me probably closer to three days to read it, and I wasn't reading all day long like I normally would. I would, I would read, you know, blocks of three and four hours and then stop and do something else. So, um, been a little, little bit of a frustration, but that hopefully will be over soon. Um, going forward, I know these haven't been some of my more popular videos, so um, I'm probably only going to do these every other week. And should the surgery go well, you know, fingers crossed, saying prayers, all that stuff that it does, um, I ought to be back up to snuff and be able to read, you know, three and four books a week. And so I'll have plenty to choose from to um, talk about. And putting a little more space in between also, you know, that'll give me anywhere from um, probably seven to eight different books in a two-week time span that I could choose to review. Um, like I said, I'm going to do this one this week. Next week you won't see anything, so it'll be the week after. Um, I'm going to try and do it every other Friday. So um, be looking for another video. Um, I'm going to do my Halloween house tour, so that should be the next video up that you see. And I hope you have enjoyed it. I certainly enjoyed the book. I'm sorry that I got so distracted between the vampish, mm, I don't know, would you call this vampish makeup? I feel like it is. It's not exactly witchy. But, you know, it is what it is. Um, but, yeah, I think going forward, it'll just be book reviews. No makeup. Um, and I appreciate you all watching. I always do. I love it when you all leave comments. Um, I love reading them. It's a lot of fun. Um, I feel like I'm connecting when you all comment. So thank you. I appreciate that. And I will see you with my next video. Thanks for watching. Bye.